Havana, the capital of Cuba, on the north coast facing the Gulf of Mexico, is today one of the most progressive cities of the Western Hemisphere. A bird's eye view of the city reveals the many landmarks of its progress and growth. Here we see the imposing chimneys of the Taya Piedra electric plant, which catch the eye for miles. The new electric plant at Regla is seen across the harbor. We have here the monument to Jose Marti at the Plaza de la Republica, erected to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Republic and surrounded by other national buildings. The heavy traffic of the city is reflected on Rancho Polleros Avenue. This constellation at the Rancho Polleros Airport is a symbol of the country's progress in air travel. Old Carlos Tercero Street is now a spacious modern avenue. The Palace of Fine Arts, where a sculpture at the entrance proclaims the high standard of the plastic arts in Cuba. One of Havana's maternity hospitals. The baby population in Cuba is growing rapidly. A new waterworks system with a 78-inch pipeline is being constructed in the southern basin of Havana province to meet the increasing water consumption of the greater Havana area. The University of Havana, one of the most advanced in the Americas, proud of its cultural traditions. The large Masonic temple recently erected by Cuban Masonic bodies. The new electromechanics building at Berlin College. The functional style of the Miramar Yacht Club distinguishes its architecture from that of other aristocratic clubs on this seafront. an up-to-date movie house in the Vedado suburb. Industrial home for the blind, founded by the Lions Club of Havana. The new American embassy building on the famous Malecon of Havana. Skyscrapers as high as 35 stories have been built throughout the city during the last few years. Most of them are residential, but some also furnish space for offices and stores. In 1948, the value of new construction throughout the island amounted to 43 million pesos. In 1954, it exceeded 70 million pesos. Cuba is a sport-loving country. At the beautiful Marianao racetrack, racing fans follow enthusiastically the sport of kings. Boxing is most popular. Cuban boxers have beaten some of the best boxers in the world. Baseball, however, is the favorite national sport in Cuba. At the new Cerro Stadium, crowds up to 36,000 fans gather to cheer the Sugar Kings, Havana and Almendares teams, as well as many amateur players. Now, let us have a look at the industrial life of the country. Cuban tobacco is recognized everywhere as the best in the world. In this factory, the selected leaf of Vuelta Bajo is converted into cigarettes. 
present consumption totals around 600 million packages annually. Coffee growing is one of Cuba's main industries. Output today meets the domestic requirements and after many years, Cuba again has coffee available for export. In 1954, Cuba imported 120 million feet of lumber. Pre-mixed concrete production started in 1947. Reinforced concrete is almost completely used in construction, replacing the steel girder type of former years. Concrete plays an important part in the construction of highways and streets. The shoe industry has developed on a big scale. In 1948, it turned out 8 million pairs of shoes. In 1954, the output was 14 million pairs. The fabrication of duraluminum for industrial purposes is a new venture in Cuba. Carlos Finley laid the foundation stone of modern Cuban medical science. There are over 180 pharmaceutical laboratories in the country. The manufacture of soft drinks has grown tremendously. In Cuba, there are 58 factories engaged in the manufacture of jerked beef, sausages, and canned meats. Paper and uh, newsprint consumption is very high in Cuba. This is a large mill. A rubber tire factory. Tire consumption has doubled in the past six years. One-third of the demand is produced in the island. Two-thirds of the wheat flour consumed in Cuba is milled at this plant in Regla. Pottery and ceramics industries flourish in the interior of the island with principal centers in Calabasar, Trinidad, Camagüey, and Santiago de Cuba. A textile factory the young and vigorous textile industry can compare with the best in Latin America. The brewery industry has increased considerably, especially in the last 10 year cycle of industrial and economic development, and national breweries have constructed new plants to meet the growing demand for beer. In 1954, production exceeded 120 million liters. Commercial activities in Havana have kept pace with the industrial development. At up-to-date and comfortable stores, many of them air-conditioned, pretty girls serve the customers who may buy all kinds of goods, ranging from aluminum container to an exclusive dress designed by Christian Dior. The beautiful swimming pool at the famous Havana Hotel. Holiday makers, most of them tourists, charmed by the attractions of Cuba, take a dip in the pool and bask in the sun. Contemporary world influence is reflected in Cuban architecture. Nubedado, a residential section built on what was once the Havana Forest, shows the trend of tropical architecture. olvidarme ha de ser imposible porque eterno recuerdo tendrá siempre de mí mis caricias será el fantasma terrible de lo mucho que sufro 
de lo mucho que sufro, alejado de ti. Quiera que mires, verás lo breguese. Y si busca otro amor, hallarás soledad. Porque todo el que olvida recoge esquiveses. Donde quiera que siembra, donde quiera que siembra. La flor de amistad Porque todo el que olvida Recoge esquiveses Donde quiera que siembra donde quiera que siembra la flor de amistad. de volver a ti más el destino manda y no puede ser mi habana mi tierra querida cuando yo te volveré a ver habana como extraño el sol indiano de tus No sé si volverán aquellos tiempos que cuando buscabas a tu luna por el malecón de mi Habana, Habana. cuánto anhelo regresar y ver tus playas Habana. y volver.
es aspiración de comerciantes y vecinos la instalación de parquímetros que permita mayor tiempo para diligencias. Bancos de importancia mundial como esta moderna sucursal de 23 y J, ideal como las otras que radican en Habana y Marianao, de la Casa Central del Chase National Bank de Nueva York, cuyos recursos sobrepasan de los 5 mil millones de pesos. Aquí los clientes realizan sus operaciones en el más confortable ambiente de aire acondicionado, música indirecta y facilidad de parqueo. Como Broadway, la gran avenida de Nueva York, 23 muestra la amplitud de su curso con cómodas aceras y la grandeza imponente de sus nuevos edificios. Entre las más importantes avenidas de nuestra capital es acaso 23 donde se observa más rápido progreso, cuyo continuo movimiento es síntoma indicador de un desarrollo vigoroso de todas sus actividades. En muchos detalles, esta moderna avenida nos recuerda a Nueva York por la diversidad de comercios. Si usted necesita un examen de la vista, aquí encontrará la esmerada atención de prometristas experimentados que dictaminarán sobre su caso poniendo a su alcance los medios más avanzados y modernos. Si se trata de flores, he aquí un verdadero vergel donde se pueden escoger las más delicadas y hermosas. Desde las maravillosas orquídeas y crisantemos hasta las exóticas aves del paraíso y anturios importadas directamente de California con las que se confeccionan los más bellos adornos florales. La más fina pastelería puede adquirirse en esta acreditada casa de la calle 23 con la más absoluta garantía de haber sido utilizada en su elaboración materiales frescos y de la mejor calidad. Las órdenes y pedidos para buffet y cakes de novio bonomástico son cruzados con entera complacencia del cliente. Avenida de tráfico intenso, amplia y limpia, se ve cruzada en todas direcciones por ómnibus que enlazan esta zona de La Habana con otras barriadas en la capital. En ella no podían faltar parques y diversiones para los niños, a los que acuden en gran número, como este de 23 y 18, bien dotados de toda clase de aparatos mecánicos que hacen las delicias de la gente menuda, disfrutando de sus juegos infantiles alegres y felices. A este edificio de 23 y 26, construcción de líneas atrevidas, le fue otorgado valioso premio el reciente Congreso Interamericano de Arquitectura celebrado en México. Un nuevo sentido en la fabricación de muebles propios para jardines, playas y otros usos, elaborados con materiales ligeros y resistentes, en multitud de colores y diseños, distinguen a esta firma de 23 y 26 que distribuye sus productos en toda Cuba. Un estudio de belleza donde la mujer recibe los más modernos tratamientos para el cutis, el cuidado de su cabello o planes científicos para la conservación de la silueta, es otro poderoso atractivo que tiene 23 para las damas. Un instituto de belleza montado a la altura de los mejores del mundo. ...123 una avenida donde se construye continuamente... ...y paso obligado de un público de alto poder adquisitivo... ...es lógico que la firma más prestigiosa en la distribución de aparatos sanitarios... ...mantenga abierta una exhibición permanente de los más lujosos juegos de baño... ...y equipos de cocina importados directamente de los principales centros de producción mundial. El puente sobre el río Almendares es otro bello lugar de la gran avenida... La luz de mil bombillos de colores anuncia la llegada de la noche y el airoso puente luce entonces más radiante y hermoso. Es de la calle 23 que se transforma en brillante ascua para mostrar su atractivo nocturno que cobra nueva vida vistiéndose de fiesta.
Los más destacados artistas del radio, la televisión y el cine coinciden en esta agencia de 23 y 26 ya popular entre la gente de la farándula. ¿Preferencia? ¿Casualidad? Más bien creemos se deba a la comprensión y gentileza que para con los artistas en general tienen los gerentes de esta casa en su trato directo con los mismos. El grupo de amigos que busca un lugar acogedor donde disfrutar unos momentos de distracción lo encuentra en el 23. Más de una vez, una pieza musical ha contribuido a fomentar la amistad. Más flores en 23. Esta exposición permanece abierta de noche y ofrece flores frescas y lozanas en las mil maneras de cumplimentar a un ser querido. De noche, la gran avenida tiene tanta animación como de día, especialmente en 23 y 12, donde el intercambio de ómnibus hace afluir un público numeroso. Ver colmado a todas horas este establecimiento es la mejor señal de que sus productos gustan. Como el Broadway neoyorquino, las brillantes luces de 23 invitan a pasear, a concurrir a sus teatros y a otros lugares de diversión. De noche como de día, es realmente hermosa y bella nuestra gran avenida. Y mientras se combina el programa de la noche, bueno es ir escogiendo el sitio ideal para disfrutar de una buena cena. Generalmente la opinión es unánime y se escoge el Carmelo de 23, ya que entre otras ventajas ofrece, por medio de sus parqueadores, un excelente servicio de día y de noche. En este lugar, donde se reúnen gran número de personas, con el mismo deseo de pasar un rato amable, la gente joven hace una parte. El tono cordial y amistoso de estas reuniones informales lo aporta siempre el brindis con fundador. Afuera, la animada 23 nos hace nuevos guiños con sus luces de colores, como invitándonos nuevamente a recorrer otros centros de diversión de la amplia vía. Como todas las avenidas importantes del mundo, cuenta con exclusivos clubs nocturnos, favorecidos por selecta concurrencia, que brinda a sus asiduos y visitantes extranjeros el lujo de sus salones, donde disfrutan en un ambiente de refinamiento del baile y shows deslumbrantes que presentan a los mejores artistas. Así es nuestra hermosa avenida de 23, orgullosa de su presente, anunciando al mundo su progreso.
oriente me voy, donde mejor se puede gozar, al carnaval de oriente me voy, donde mejor se puede gozar.
fuiste a Guanabacoa a casa de un babalao pa' que mirara mi casa y a mí que estaba salado me cobraron unos cinco yo solo pagué la mesa los papagayos y palomas no entraron en esa cuenta Yo gordo, me trae manteca y cacao, me trae maíz, miel de abeja ¡Ah! y 475, que ya se me había olvidado. Y 475, que ya se me había olvidado. The zoo, one of the most spacious and beautiful corners of the city. Here, many and varied specimens of world fauna delight visitors. Bridge over the Almendares River, linking Havana City and Marianao with its constant stream of traffic. On Fifth Avenue, near the beaches, the street vendors with their wares. The luscious tropical fruits invitingly whet the appetite. A modern church in Miramar. In the country club suburb, we see the finest Cuban residences. A universal style seems to blend nicely with the tropical brightness and atmosphere. We have seen something of the economic and industrial development of the nation, its landscapes and beauty. We are to show you now how the Cuban Electric Company is contributing with its expansion program to keep pace with the nation's progress. The word electricity immediately brings to mind a picture of economic progress and material welfare. Without an adequate supply of electricity, no modern nation can prosper. As will be appreciated from this picture, there is a definite relationship between the dynamic growth of Cuba in recent years and the ability of its electric power industry to deliver good, dependable service to the island's factories, commercial establishments, farms, and homes. Indeed, the electric plant at Talla Piedra in Havana has been, for years now, a symbol of the economic strength of the country. This plant, with its five units of a total capacity of 80,500 kilowatts, is synchronized by means of a 110,000 volt network with Regla and other plants. While still the largest of the company's plants in the island, in the near future, it will be surpassed by the new Regla plant, which once completed, will have a capacity of more than double that of Talla Piedra. The operation of the main switchboard, which controls the complicated process of generating and distributing electrical current, requires expert, responsible personnel. These picked operators are the best guarantee to ensure to our consumers a good, dependable, and uninterrupted service. At the company's main warehouse in Talla Piedra, 
are to be found not only the largest transformers and the heaviest cables, but also the smallest precision instruments supplied from many lands. The equipment and materials stored throughout the island, not including those to be used for projects under construction, represent an investment of approximately three million pesos. The Regla Electric Plant project consists of four units, of which two are already in service, one of 30,000 kilowatts capacity, another of 40,000. A third unit of 60,000 kilowatts, still to be built, is expected to be ready by the end of 1957. A total of 16 million pesos already has been spent on this plant, and it is estimated that the total project will cost around 40 million pesos. The energy from the regular plant is transmitted at 110,000 volts throughout underground cables within the city limits of Regla and from there on by overhead to reach the Naranjito substation. This interconnection costs in the neighborhood of 2 million pesos. Naranjito is the site of the company's largest substation and also the dispatcher's office which coordinates the production and distribution of electricity for the whole central system. This network extends from Paso Real in Pinar del Rio province to Nuevitas in Camagüey province. The switchboard indicates the load fluctuations which guide the dispatcher in giving the proper instructions to all the generating plants and switching stations. Over two million pesos has already been spent on this substation and several millions will be invested in future additions. An important human factor of the electric power company is the lineman who works on the poles between wires and cross arms. He is well protected by all kinds of safety devices to minimize the dangers of his job. Gloves, safety belts, climbers and rubber protectors are all part of his working equipment which permits him to attend rapidly any service interruptions with a feeling of security for himself, his fellow workers and the public. To ensure the consumer a good and prompt service, the company has installed radio telephone communication between its centers of operation and the service trucks in the streets which attend to any emergency. When the shadows of the night cover the city, electricity brightens the whole panorama. The multicolored electric signs dispel the darkness. a luxurious Havana nightclub presenting world-famous shows. To the accompaniment of lively Cuban music, seductive dancers put on their floor shows in an attractive background. Rosita Fornes is the beautiful Cuban star of this show. The stately pine groves and the vast tobacco plantations of Pinar del Rio province match in the beauty the high quality of the Cuban tobacco which grows in its soil. On this green and fertile plantation at San Juan y Martinez, there grows the finest leaf tobacco in the world, the raw material of the renowned Cuban cigar known the world over for its unmatched quality. Leaf tobacco production 1947 
totaled 77 million pounds. In 1954, it reached 90 millions. Soror Hills, in the mountainous northern zone. The crystal waters of Soror waterfalls fall majestically on the hard stones below. Nearby, Pilila Ranch houses one of the most beautiful orchid collections in the world. Vinales, the peaceful scenic charm of Vinales, symbol of peace, which stirs in the human mind the enchantment and beauty of this centuries-old valley. Pineapple is one of the tastiest of the many delicious fruits grown in Cuba and is cultivated all over the island. Current exports are estimated at some two million crates per year. In this factory at Artemisa in Pinar del Rio province, pineapple is mixed with various syrups for exportation to the United States in semi-processed form. The importance of rice in the Cuban diet can be appreciated from the fact that the per capita consumption is 120 pounds per year. The island's total consumption at present amounts to 7 million quintals with a value of approximately 72 million pesos of which 40% is now produced in Cuba. That is about 10 times more than 15 years ago. Minerals rank third among Cuba's exports, next after sugar and tobacco products. Total mineral exports amounted to 37 million pesos in 1953 and 30 million pesos in 1954. These are the Mata Hambre copper mines in Pinar del Rio. Copper and manganese make up the bulk of the island's present mineral production. Iron ore output is rather small due to the low price of this mineral. Nickel production, which had stopped for several years after a wartime spurt, has been resumed and is being stepped up. Considerable activity may be seen in the mining zone of Moa in Oriente province, where a big plant is being installed for the concentration of nickel, cobalt, and chrome. These minerals, it is believed, will occupy first place among Cuba's mineral exports in the next few years. Varadero, the most beautiful beach in America on the north coast of Matanzas province.
The new Paso Malo Canal at Varadero, recently completed and very useful to yachtsmen. Guitera's Bridge at the mouth of the Canima River on the Via Blanca Highway. Rayon Factory in Matanzas. Cuba started to manufacture rayon only seven years ago. In 1953, production amounted to approximately 10,000 tons, of which 2,500 was rayon yarn. Total output of Hennigan in 1954 amounted to 33 million pounds, of which some 15 million pounds were exported to the United States and Canada. There are at present 11 modern Hennigan plants in Cuba like this one at Matanzas. A sugar mill, the sugar industry accounts for 81% of the island's exports, utilizes 30% of its soil and 70% of its transportation, and represents from 30 to 40% of the national income. Sugar output in 1955 was 4,396,000 long tons. Cardenas, on the north coast of Matanzas, is one of the large al alcohol distilling centers of Cuba. The very up-to-date electric plant in Matanzas is the largest operated by the company in the interior of the island. It has two units of 15,000 kilowatts each, the first completed in 1951 and the second a year later. It cost over six million pesos. This plant is connected to Havana by a direct transmission line of 66,000 volts, prepared to carry 110,000 volts and which cost about three million pesos. And it is also interconnected with the central network by means of various 33,000 volt lines. These generators are driven by steam from oil burning boilers operating at a pressure of 600 pounds per square inch. Anabanilla waterfalls the largest and most colorful in Cuba, in the mountains near Cienfuegos, Las Villas province. Marta Abreu University on the outskirts of Santa Clara. Founded less than four years ago, it has already accomplished some very creditable scientific and cultural work for the country. The new Orfelio Ramos Hotel at Santa Clara. New hotels are mushrooming all over the island. In Manacas, near Santo Domingo, we see a modern brewery which, together with other new industries, has enriched his central part of Cuba. New tanneries, like this one at Caibarien, tan some 700,000 hides every year throughout the island. The province of Las Villas has three important fishing centers, Cienfuegos, Isabela de Sagua, and this one at Caibarien. The total value of the 1954 fishing production was about 5 million pesos. 80% of the striped tunny and tunny fish consumed in Cuba is fished locally. The island with its 69 ports and some uh, 1,600 keys along its coastline offers unusual opportunities for the expansion of the fishing industry. The modern, lovely city of Cienfuegos, Hawa Bay, serene in its vastness, lies between colorful mountains and trees of dark green, as if Mother Nature had designed to protect it from the fury of the elements. Cienfuegos has two electric plants, an old one of 6,100 kilowatts capacity and a modern one of 10,000 kilowatts situated in the district of Aburque, on the other side of the bay and which dates from 1950 and cost about three million pesos. 
the Opolka plant was the first in Cuba in which boilers of the outdoor type were installed. The two generators of 5,000 kilowatts each are of the most modern design. From the Cuatro Camino substation on the outskirts of Cienfuegos, a high line goes out to Santa Clara. Roofs, patios, and huge colonial earthen jars, typical of the architecture and tradition of Camagüey. Monument to the patriot Ignacio Agramonte, who coined the famous phrase, to fight for the liberty of Cuba, the arms of honest purpose are sufficient. New hospital under construction in Camagüey. The famous orange groves in Ceballos, where fertility is increased through the efficient use of irrigation powered by electricity. Orange output, 1953, amounted to two million crates. In the numerous ranches of the Camagüey Plains, are to be found the best pasture lands on the island. Camagüey is the largest cattle racing province of Cuba. Total value of the Cuban cattle industry is estimated at about 100 billion pesos. The value of annual consumption of the various products derived from the cattle industry is estimated as follows. Meat, 64 million pesos. Cheese, three and a half million pesos. Hides, three million pesos. 90% of Cuban farms raise cattle. In 1954, Cuba produced a total of 1,200 boxes of condensed milk, and the yearly value of the dairy industry output exceeds 100 million pesos. Modern sawmills like this one in Camagüey turn out 20% of the wood used in the country. The warehouses and workshops of the Consolidated Railroads of Cuba are located in the city of Camagüey. A heavy traffic of modern trains moves through the Camagüey station. Camagüey Electric Station has a total capacity of 14,500 kilowatts and consists of four units, two of which, of 5,000 kilowatts each, were installed recently. The rich province of Camagüey uses electric service quite extensively for both agriculture and industry. The people of this province have learned to use electric power to great advantage in improving the yield of their cane fields and orange groves, as well as to increase the industrial output from the many products derived from the flourishing cattle business with beneficial effects on the living standard of that region. To meet adequately the growing demands for electricity in this province, the company recently has started to build at Vicente near Ciego de Avila a new steam electric plant of 10,000 kilowatts capacity which will cost over three and a half million pesos and which ought to be ready for service in October 1956. The power plant workshop is an important factor in maintaining all equipment in good running condition and requires specially trained operators like the one shown here working at turning lathe. Santiago de Cuba, cradle of rebellion and patriotic heroism. Padre Pico Street, 
one of the oldest of the capital of Oriente province. The Cuban natural scenery changes entirely in its easternmost province. The majesty and ruggedness of its geography are impressive. The Moro Castle at the top of Santiago de Cuba Bay. Jose Marti's tombstone in Santa Ifigenia Cemetery. House where Antonio Maceo was born. Maceo was the greatest of Cuban warriors. San Juan Hill, battlefield of the Spanish-American War. Historical fort at San Juan Hill. Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Monument to the glory of the victorious Cuban warrior. Tasteful mangoes of El Caney, the most delicious of the many Cuban varieties. The young University of Oriente, with a deep sense of its mission for the cultural progress and development of Cuba, is concentrating its activities on science. Convinced of the importance of scientific training and research for the benefit of the nation, but without losing sight of spiritual, ethical, and civic values as well. The fame of Cuban rum is worldwide. The old Bacardi plant in Santiago de Cuba is the largest rum factory in the country. Exportation of this product increases every year. Modern cement factory in Santiago de Cuba. Output for the whole island in 1954 reached two and a half million barrels, equivalent to 70% of the country's consumption and almost double that of eight years ago. Oriente has its own network, independent of the central system, which serves the territory from Campechuela to Guantanamo. Its three electric plants in Santiago, Manzanillo, and Guaso have a total generating capacity of 26,800 kilowatts. In Santiago, two units of 5,000 kilowatts each have been installed recently, and in the near future, work will begin on an eighth unit of 10,000 kilowatts, which will cost around 3 million pesos, and which it is hoped will be in operation by July 1957. And so, friends, you have seen the enormous strides made by Cuba in recent years, and the important role played in such progress by Cuban Electric Company, which supplies more than 90% of all the electric power used in Cuba. Over the past nine years, the company has invested nearly 100 million pesos in new facilities to meet the growing demands of the country. Today, it has a total generating capacity of 267,000 kilowatts, which ought to be increased to approximately 380,000 kilowatts by 1960. But to continue the adequate financing of its vast expansion program, Cuban Electric needs the cooperation of the Cuban people through their participation in the purchase of the company's first mortgage bonds. These bonds possess five important characteristics. First, they bear an annual interest rate of 5%. Second, they are guaranteed by the solid security of all of the company's properties valued at over 225 million pesos. Third, the interest coupons are paid promptly. Fourth, the bonds are listed on the Havana Stock Exchange and therefore are easy to sell in the open market. And fifth, they may be conveniently used as security for loans. Yes, it's hard to find a better investment or one that offers as many attractive features as the first mortgage bonds of Cuban Electric Company. These bonds can be purchased through any broker member of the Havana Stock Exchange or from the firm of Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner and Bean or at any of the offices of Cuban Electric Company.
when we think about the geography of Cuba, we might keep in mind two important ideas. First, Cuba is an island. Second, Cuba has a tropical climate. Let's learn more about this island and its people. Here are some of the people of rural Cuba. There are many different types of Cuban people, including those descended from the original Spanish settlers, those descended from Negro slaves brought to the island, and some descended from various European and West Indies peoples. What relationships can we find between these people and the big island on which they live? The tropical island of Cuba lies in the Caribbean Sea, just south of the United States and east of Mexico. It is only 90 miles from the United States, so near that the affairs of the two countries have always been closely related. Cuba's strategic position puts it on important sea lanes, here, here, and here. Two of these lanes are gateways to the Panama Canal. Because of its strategic position, Cuba was called the key to the new world by the early Spanish explorers. The Spaniards settled Cuba and built many cities, including Havana, still called by the Spanish name La Havana, and Santiago. In Santiago, we can see today something of Spanish history in the old buildings and streets. We find evidence of the Spanish conquest in the great fortifications in Santiago Harbor. Here, too, are scenes of the Cuban struggle for independence from Spain, a struggle in which the United States took part. In Santiago Channel, a Spanish fleet was defeated by the United States in 1898. On San Juan Hill, American and Cuban troops won another victory. On the hill today, this memorial represents the combined Cuban and American fight for the island's independence from Spain. And so much of Cuba's history has been influenced by the importance of its island position as key to the new world. One way to see more of Cuba and its people is to go along the central highway. It extends from Havana to Santiago, a distance of about 700 miles. Starting in the city of Santiago, we meet more of the Cuban people, people of many different types who make up Cuba's mixed population. Following this bus from Santiago to Havana, we'll see more of the fertile, beautiful island. Here, at the eastern end of the island, are some of Cuba's highest mountains. There are mountains similar to these throughout the length of the island. It is here, in the mountainous region of the eastern end, that many of Cuba's forests and most of its minerals are found. Among the ores mined in eastern Cuba are iron, nickel, copper, and chrome. This mine produces manganese, an ore used in the manufacture of a hard type of steel. Among the many kinds of tropical trees that grow in eastern Cuba is mahogany, much of the mahogany wood is exported to the United States. Moving westward along the island, we see green fields on both sides of the highway. Here in the central portion of Cuba are some of its most productive regions. Much of the land is used to grow sugar cane, the most important product of Cuba. Sugar cane is a tropical plant and in Cuba's warm, moist climate and fertile soil, it grows so abundantly that five or six crops can be harvested from the same plants. Much of the crop is harvested by hand laborers who use sharp knives called machetes. Let's meet one of the workmen in this field. His name is Jose Hernandez. He swings his machete again and again, cutting the ripe stalks. After cutting the stalks, Jose gathers them up and helps load them into a truck. Jose and the other men do not work in the fields during the hottest part of the day. 
from noon until about four o'clock, they go to their homes to rest, or as they say, to take a siesta. Jose and his family live in a simple thatched hut called a boio. Jose owns a goat and a few ducks and chickens, which his wife cares for. Near the hut are some banana trees that provide fresh fruit for the family. As in most tropical countries, life is easy and pleasant. For the siesta, everyone goes inside the hut to rest. After siesta, work on the plantations is resumed. In the midst of the plantation is the central, or sugar mill, where the harvested sugar cane is brought to be processed. At the central, the cane is pressed and the juice is changed into raw sugar. In some mills, the raw sugar is further processed into refined sugar. From this single product, sugar, comes most of Cuba's wealth. And where is the sugar sent? Most of it goes to Cuba's close neighbor, the United States. What else does Cuba send us? Let's follow the central highway into the western part of the island to find out. Knowing Cuba's tropical climate, we're not surprised to see fields of pineapples along the highway. Like sugarcane, pineapples thrive in Cuba's fertile soil and year-round warm weather. Much of this tropical fruit is sent to the United States. Another crop which brings wealth to Cuba is tobacco. Certain varieties of tobacco are grown under cloth for protection from the hot sun. Cuban laborers handle the crop through all stages, the growing of the plants, the harvesting of the tobacco leaves, and the final making of cigars. This is one of the many cigar factories in Havana. Supervising the work is the foreman, Miguel Perez. Senor Perez is one of many men who earn their living in the tobacco industry. Let's follow Miguel Perez as he leaves the factory to go to his home in Havana. He dodges the traffic of the evening rush hour and runs to catch his bus for home. The bus passes the Prado Havana's famous boulevard. Nearby is the University of Havana. Among the students is Pedro Perez, Miguel's son. After classes, Pedro and his fellow students walk through Havana. They pass the Capitol, a beautiful building that resembles the United States Capitol in Washington. Later, Pedro and his friends find their way to one of Havana's beaches. Cuba's beautiful beaches and pleasant climate are among the attractions that bring tourists from other lands, many of them from the United States. The Cubans, too, appreciate the beauties of their own land. Sometimes for recreation, Miguel takes his family for a drive through Havana. Among the familiar Havana sites that the family sees, is this statue of Jose Marti, the hero of Cuba's War of Independence. Here is Columbus Cathedral, named after the famous discoverer of the New World. Along Havana's docks are ships loading Cuban products that go to the United States and other countries. And near the mouth of Havana Harbor stands Morro Castle, one of the great forts that the early Spaniards built to protect their island their key to the new world. And from then on until the present day, Cuba's history and geography have been closely related to its island position. Its nearness to America has made it a good neighbor, a neighbor whose history is closely related to that of the United States. Cuba's natural wealth includes many valuable products. Among them are tropical woods such as mahogany, tropical fruits, such as pineapple, special crops, such as high-grade tobacco, and of course, 
the most important single product, sugar. These are some of the things produced by the Cuban people who live on the big island with the tropical climate. 